My name is Bruce Perry. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and a developmental neurobiologist. And I am the senior fellow of the Child Trauma Academy, which is based in Houston, Texas, and an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Northwestern University in Chicago. And I have been working <clears throat> for the last, oh gosh, 30 years uh, trying to understand the impact of developmental experiences on the brain. And, and really what that means is uh, I've been looking at how experiences, both good and bad, uh, influence how the brain develops and then what that means for function. And the primary group that we work with is children who've been uh, traumatized and usually traumatized in context of abuse or neglect. So over the years, uh, we have learned a lot about how experience changes the developing brain. And we're learning more now about how certain healing and reparative experiences can restore function in children who've had their brains altered or impacted by developmental trauma. As a child grows up, there's a sequence of mastery in the development of a function. So for example, with motor development, we know that children will crawl before they'll walk, and they walk before they run, and they run before they can ride a bike. And so it's the same way with other functions, that uh, you learn how to add, and then you learn how to multiply, and then you can learn algebra. There's a sequence of uh, functional capability. And really, those functional capabilities are a reflection of the sequential development of the brain. And so what we know about the brain is that <clears throat> it's organized into different systems. And there are top parts of our brain, the most complex that are involved in thinking and planning and speech and language. And then there's lower parts of the brain that are involved in more regulatory functions, things like um, regulating your heart rate or your blood pressure. And so these lower parts of the brain develop first in life. And as you get older as a child, there's a sequential development of the brain. With every part of the brain that's organizing, depending upon the previous successful organization of lower parts of the brain. And so one of the things that we know is uh, that these lower areas of the brain, which send organizing signals up into higher parts of the brain are essential to healthy development. That if the lower parts of your brain are well regulated and well organized, that means that there will be a much easier and, and healthy developmental process that can follow. You know, one of the most uh, challenging aspects of the modern life of a child is that we've invented ourselves into a lifestyle that has uh, significantly fewer relational interactions and relational opportunities than our brain is designed for. And we've designed a world that is significantly less uh, permeated with touch and movement and exploration than in physical explore, exploration than we are designed for. So if you think about the human species, for 99.9% .9 of the time we've been on the planet, we've lived in multi-generational, multi-family groups where there was continuous relational interaction between uh, infants, children, adolescents, toddlers. Everybody was all mixed up and spent all kinds of time together. And there was no screen time. There were, when we learned things, we didn't sit for eight hours and not move and just be expected to listen in this passive way and, and internalize content. We learned because we were exploring, we were falling around adults, we were falling around older kids, we were moving, we were using all of our senses. We'd grab something and we'd smell it and we'd throw it and then we'd go pick it up and we'd run and we would do all kinds of physical, social and cognitive stimulation that is actually quite rare in today's world. So one of the things that's most disturbing for me as you know, an observer of our society is that 
the number of relational interactions that a typical American child has uh, is about one twenty-fourth of the relational density that would be present in a primitive hunter-gatherer community. And the other part that really bothers me a lot is that the, the incredible power and value of movement is completely minimized in our culture. Um, we, we tend to forget the fact that we are meant to move. Human beings are meant to move. We're designed. I mean, it's one of the major unique design elements of our species is that we're upright. I think the most important thing that a parent can understand about neurobiology is that their presence matters. That the way they are engaged with their child and the opportunities that they provide for their child literally make a difference in how the brain organizes, that in turn will make a difference in the way the child regulates, the way the child learns, the way the child creates, how productive the child is, how humane the child is. And so the bottom line is this, is that your presence matters. And the way in which you are present matters. One of the most um, important things that a caregiver or a parent can do for a child is not underestimate how important it is to provide lots of sensory stimulation. And really for the parent what that means is this. Skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact. Touch is really a wonderful thing to provide for a child. Conversation. Uh, singing with them. Moving with them. Uh, all kinds of things that are absolutely easy to do and kind of part of the normal healthy parenting experience uh, turns out to be re exactly what the brain needs. And so the, the bottom line is this, you don't have to go take parenting classes, you don't have to become an expert in brain development, you don't have to do much, really, you don't, it's not about what you know, it's about what you do. And so you can take somebody who knows nothing about all of the advances in neurobiology and all the advances in child development, and they will be doing all of the right wonderful things because it is driven by love and that's the great thing it, it, love loving a child pulls you to engage them in ways that are enriched with these somatosensory things that we know are great for kids so you literally feel you know you want to go over there they're so cute you want to pinch their cheeks and and you just want to give them a hug and it feels good to hold hands with your child when you're out taking a walk and you like to be with them and you like to talk with them and and those things that are being, you're being pulled to do because you love your child are pretty much the things that are good for the, the brain in a somatosensory respect. And, you know, the question about, that people ask is like, how much somatosensory stimulation is enough? How, sh how do I, how much should I do it? Should I, you know, hug them twice a day or three times a day or whatever? Honestly, that's a little bit challenging to, to answer. We don't know that much about that. We, we don't know how much is absolutely uh, essential and how much is, would be too much. My gut feeling about this is that um, you really probably can't do too much of this positive you know, conversation and giving a kid a hug and being with them. And, and the best indicator of when you are doing too much is, is to remember that experience of being a parent with your little toddler when they come over and they're running in your arms and you give them a hug and, and you feel so good, you love giving them that hug and, and then they'll start to push away because you know they've gotten enough, they want to go explore the world. And so to some degree, you can take their, their lead on how much of this somatosensory stuff is enough.